Part one, sections twenty three to thirty four of All Things Are Possible by Lev Shestov, translated by S. S. Kotelyansky, eighteen eighty eight to nineteen fifty five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part one, section twenty three. The first assumption of all metaphysics is that by dialectic development of any concept a whole system can be evolved of course the initial concept the a priori is generally unsound so there is no need to mention the deductions but since it is very difficult in the realm of abstract thought to distinguish a lie from truth metaphysical systems often have a very convincing appearance the chief defect only appears incidentally when the taste for dialectic play becomes blunted in man as it did in turgenev towards the end of his life so that he realizes the uselessness of philosophical systems it is related that a famous mathematician after hearing a musical symphony to the end inquired what does it prove of course it proves nothing except that the mathematician had no taste for music and to him who has no taste for dialectics metaphysics can prove nothing either therefore those who are interested in the success of metaphysics must always encourage the opinion that a taste for dialectics is a high distinction in a man proving the loftiness of his soul twenty four man is used to having convictions so there we are we can none of us do without our hangers-on though we despise them at the bottom of our souls twenty five socrates and plato tried to determine under the shifting change of appearance the immutable unchanging reality in the platonic ideas the attempt was incarnated the visible reality never true to itself assuming numberless varying forms this is not the genuine reality that which is real must be constant hence the ideas of objects are real and the objects themselves are fictitious thus the root of the platonic philosophy appears to be a fundamental defect in human reasoning a defect regarded as the highest merit it is difficult for the philosopher to get a good grasp of this agitated capricious life and so he decides that it is not life at all but a figment dialectics is supreme only over general concepts and the general concepts are promoted to an ideal since plato and socrates only such philosophers have succeeded largely who have taught that the unchangeable is preferable to the changeable the eternal to the temporal the ordinary individual who lives unconsciously never reckoning his spiritual credit against his spiritual debit naturally regards the philosopher as his legitimate bookkeeper keeper of the soul's accounts already in greece the athenian youth watched with passionate interest the dexterity which socrates displayed in his endeavour to restore by means of dialectics the lost ultimate foundations of human conduct now in bookkeeping as we are aware not a single farthing must disappear untraceably socrates was trying to come up to expectations the balance between man's spiritual assets and liabilities was with him ideally established perhaps in this lies the secret of that strange attraction he exerted even over such volatile and unsteady natures as that of alcibiades drawing the young men to him so that they were attached to him with all their soul alcibiades had long since lost all count of his spiritual estate and therefore from time to time he had need to recourse to socrates who by speeches and dissertations could bring order into chaos and harmony into the spiritual confusion of his young friend alcibiades turned to socrates to be relieved of course he sought relief in order that he might begin again his riotous living rest is so sweet to a tired man but to conclude that because alcibiades exhausted himself and because rest is sweet therefore all men must rest this is absurd yet socrates dictated this conclusion in all his ideas he wished that all men should rest rest through eternity that they should see their highest fulfilment in this resting it is easier to judge of socrates since we have count tolstoy with us probably the physiognomist topir 
would say of tolstoy as he said of socrates that there are many evil propensities lurking in him topir is not here to speak but tolstoy has told us himself how wicked he found his own nature how he had to struggle with it tolstoy is not naturally over courageous by long effort he has trained himself to be bold how afraid of death he was in his youth and how cleverly he could conceal that fear later on in mature age it was still the fear of death which inspired him to write his confession he was conquering that fear and with it all other fears for he felt that since fear is very difficult to master in oneself man must be a much higher being when he has learned not to be afraid any more meanwhile who knows perhaps cowardice that miserable despicable much abused weakness of the underworld is not such a vice after all perhaps it is even a virtue think of dostoevsky and his heroes think of hamlet if the underworld man in us were afraid of nothing if hamlet were naturally a gladiator then we should have neither tragic poetry nor philosophy it is a platitude that fear of death has been the inspiration of philosophers numberless quotations could be drawn from ancient and modern writers if they were necessary maybe the poetic daimon of socrates which made him wise was only fear personified or perhaps it was his dark dreams that which troubled him by day did not quit him by night even after the sentence of death socrates dreamed that he ought to engage in the arts so in order not to provoke the gods he began to compose verses at the age of seventy tolstoy also at the age of fifty began to perform good deeds to which performance he had previously given not the slightest attention if it were our custom nowadays to express ourselves mythologically we should no doubt hear tolstoy telling us about his daimon or his dreams instead he squares his accounts with science and morality in place of gods or demons many a present-day alcibiades who laves all the week in the muddy waters of life comes on sundays to cleanse himself in the pure stream of tolstoyan ideas bookkeeping is satisfied with this modest success and assumes that if it commands universal attention one day in the week then obviously it is the sum and essence of life beyond which man needs nothing on the same grounds the keepers of public baths could argue that since so many people come to them on saturdays therefore cleanliness is the highest ambition of man and during the week no one should stir at all lest he sweat or soil himself twenty six in an old french writer a contemporary of pascal i came across the following remarkable words Note what follows is a lengthy french quote translation provided by the reader End note. man is so miserable that the inconstancy with which he abandons his plans is in some sense his greatest virtue because it bears witness that he still has in him a remnant of grandeur that is the doorway into disgust of things that do not deserve his love and esteem what a long way modern thought has travelled from even the possibility of such an assumption to consider inconstancy the finest human virtue surely in order to get somewhere in life it is necessary to give the whole self one's whole energy to the service of some one particular purpose in order to be a virtuoso a master of one's art and one's instrument it is necessary with a truly angelic or asinine patience to try over and over again dozens hundreds thousands of times different ways of expressing one's ideas or moods sparing neither labour nor time nor health everything else must take a second place the first must be occupied by the art goncharov in his novel oblomov cleverly relates how a cellist struggled all day like a fish against the ice sawing and sawing away so that later on in the evening he might play super excellently well and that is a general idea objectionable tedious irritating labour this is the condition of genius which no doubt explains the reason why men so rarely achieve anything genius must submit to cultivate an ass within itself the condition being so humiliating that man will seldom take up the job 
the majority prefer talent that medium which lies between genius and mediocrity and many a time towards the end of life does the genius repent of his choice it would be better not to startle the world but to live at one with it says ibsen in his last drama genius is a wretched blind maniac whose eccentricities are condoned because of what is got from him and still we all bow to persevering talent to the only god in whom we moderns believe and the eulogy of inconstancy will awake very little sympathy in our hearts probably we shall not even regard it seriously twenty seven we very often express in a categorical form a judgment of which we do not feel assured we even lay stress on its absolute validity we want to see what opposition it will arouse and this can be achieved only by stating our assumption not as a tentative suggestion which no one will consider but as an irrefutable all-important truth the greater the value an assumption has for us the more carefully do we conceal any suggestion of its improbability twenty eight literature deals with the most difficult and important problems of existence and therefore litterateurs consider themselves the most important of people a bank clerk who is always handing money out might just as well consider himself a millionaire the high estimate placed upon unexplained unsolved questions ought really to discredit writers in our eyes and yet these literary men are so clever so cunning at stating their own case and revealing the high importance of their mission that in the long run they convince everybody themselves most of all this last event is surely owing to their own limited intelligence the roman augurs had subtler more versatile minds in order to deceive others they had no need to deceive themselves in their own set they were not afraid to talk about their secrets even to make fun of them being fully confident that they could easily vindicate themselves before outsiders in case of necessity and pull a solemn face befitting the occasion but our writers of to-day before they can lay their improbable assertions before the public must inevitably try to be convinced in their own minds otherwise they cannot begin twenty nine the writer is writing away the reader is reading away the writer doesn't care what the reader is after the reader doesn't care what the writer is about such a state of things hurt shedron very much he would have liked it different no sooner has the writer said a word than the reader at once scales the wall this was his ideal but the reader is by no means so naive as all that he prefers to rest easy and insists that the writer shall climb the wall for him so those authors succeed with the public who write with their heart's blood conventional tournaments even the most brilliant do not attract the masses any more than the connoisseurs people rush to see a flight of gladiators where awaits them a scent of real hot smoking blood where they are going to see real not pretended victims thus many writers like gladiators shed their blood to gratify that modern caesar the mob salve caesar morituri te salutant thirty anton chekhov tells the truth neither out of love nor respect for the truth nor yet because in the kantian manner a high duty bids him never to tell a lie even to escape death neither has he the impulse which so often pushes young and fiery souls into rashness that desire to stand erect to keep the head high on the contrary chekhov always walks with a stoop his head bent down never fixing his eyes on the heavens since he will read no signs there if he tells the truth it is because the most reeking lie no longer intoxicates him even though he swallow it not in the modest doses that idealism offers but in immoderate quantities thousand gallon barrel gulps he would taste the bitterness but it would not make his head turn as it does schiller's or dostoevsky's or even socrates whose head as we know could stand any quantity of wine but went spinning with the most commonplace lie thirty one noblesse oblige the moment of obligation compulsion duty that moment described by kant as the essential almost the only predicate of moral concepts 
serve chiefly to indicate that Kant was modest in himself and in his attitude towards all whom he addressed, perceiving in all men being subject to the ennobling effect of morality. Noblesse oblige is a motto not for the aristocracy, which recognizes in its privileges its own instant duties, but for the self-made wealthy parvenus who pant for an illustrious title. They have been accustomed to telling lies, to playing poltroon, swindling and meanness, and the necessity for speaking the truth impartially, for bravely facing danger, for freely giving of their fortunes, scares them beyond measure. Therefore it is necessary that they should repeat it to themselves and to their children, in whose veins the lying, sneaking blood still runs hourly lest they forget. You must not tell lies. You must be open, magnanimous. It is silly, it is incomprehensible, but noblesse oblige. 32. Homo homini lupus is one of the most steadfast maxims of eternal morality. In each of our neighbors we fear a wolf. This fellow is evil-minded. If he is not restrained by law, he will ruin us. So we think every time a man gets out of the rut of sanctified tradition. The fear is just. We are so poor, so weak, so easily ruined and destroyed. How can we help being afraid? And yet, behind danger and menace, there is usually hidden something significant, which merits our close and sympathetic attention. But fear's eyes are big. We see danger, danger only. We build up a fabric of morality, inside which, as in a fortress, we sit out of danger all our lives. Only poets have undertaken to praise dangerous people, Don Juans, Faust, Tannhäusers. But nobody takes the poets seriously. Common sense values a commercial traveller or a Don much more highly than a Byron, a Goethe, or a Moliere. 33. The possibilities which open out before mankind are sufficiently limited. It is impossible to see everything, impossible to know everything, impossible to rise too high above the earth, impossible to penetrate too deeply down. What has been is hidden away, what will be we cannot anticipate, and we know for certain that we shall never grow wings. Regularity, immutably regular succession of phenomena, puts a term to our efforts, drives us into a regular, narrow, hard-beaten road of everyday life. But even on this road we may not wander from side to side. We must watch our feet, consider each step. Since the moment we are off our guard, disaster is upon us. Another life is conceivable, however, life in which the word disaster does not exist, where responsibility for one's actions, even if it be not completely abolished, at least has not such a deadly and accidental weight, and where, on the other hand, there is no regularity, but rather an infinite number of possibilities. In such a life, the sense of fear, most disgraceful to us, disappears. There the virtues are not the same as ours, Fearlessness in face of danger, liberality, even lavishness, are considered virtues with us, but they are respected without any grounds. Socrates was quite right when he argued that not all courage, but only the courage which measures beforehand the risks and the chances of victory, is fully justifiable. To the same extent, those economical, careful people who condemn lavishness are in the right fearlessness and lavishness do not suit mortal men rather it becomes them to tremble and to count every penny seeing what a state of poverty and impotence they exist in that is why these two virtues are so rarely met with and when they are met why they arouse such superstitious reverence in the crowd this man fears nothing and spares nothing he is probably not a man but a demigod perhaps even a god Socrates did not believe in gods, so he wanted to justify virtue by reason. Kant also did not believe in God, and therefore he derived his morals from law. But if there is a God, and all men are the children of God, then we should be afraid of nothing and spare nothing. And then the man who madly dissipates his own life and fortunes, and the lives and fortunes of others, is more right than the calculating philosophers who vainly seek to regulate mankind on earth. 34. Moral people are the most revengeful of mankind. 
they employ their morality as the best and most subtle weapon of vengeance they are not satisfied with simply despising and condemning their neighbour themselves they want the condemnation to be universal and supreme that is that all men should rise as one against the condemned and that even the offender's own conscience shall be against him then only are they fully satisfied and reassured nothing on earth but morality could lead to such wonderful results end of part one section thirty four recording by expatriate in bangor maine